Yeah, sorry. What, what, what was the last comment here? He said they were going to type printing out one type of attachment today. Oh, cool. Okay. Do you have everything, Jeremy, to get going on that? You think you're pretty clear on it? On the pen plotter? Yeah. Yeah, I think I can, I think I can make it through that. I think um, probably without much. I, I went through the Inkscape tutorials and, uh, on how to draw the key code pads yesterday. Okay. Um, and my pr my printer's printing fairly well, so um, yeah, I think I can make it through. Okay. Um, let's see. So I'm looking at Don Log where I, because maybe you can do the. So I have some a hard time uh, uploading things. So. Yeah. So that's a screenshot I tried to take. This is the file. So it was like it's it red, so it it's not uploaded. So just click on it, and then I'll try to upload file. that again. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so on Donlog, mon Monday, January twenty-seven. There's a file called X. Yeah, the first FreeCAD file on the plotter there, uh, which is and that should work. That therefore you have to just. Uh, that does require that you disassemble the one side of the extruder and put on this new piece that holds the pen, which is attached basically to the blower, um, to the blower. So that's one way to do it. You, or, or otherwise, you can do the other one. And the only comment is, when you're printing it, do the wall thickness properly, because you. You know how you get the view where you can view the actual lines, how they're going to get printed within Acura? Uh -huh. Have you done that? Have you yeah, seen the layers? Yeah, the layer yeah. view? Yep. Yep. In the layer view, make sure the you have the line, basically wall thickness set to a low enough value. I think we used like 1.0 millimeter or... Yeah. Yeah, 1.0 millimeter, not 1.2, which is what I think you would have. And that makes the lines come out because yeah. those lines in there are thin. So that's that's the only thing. Beyond that, we went through. Uh, it's the FAQ. Uh, there's an FAQ on the D3D Universal page at the very bottom. Uh, Tom, is that where you put all the Cura documentation, or where'd you put all the Cura documentation? Okay, uh, so once again, um, I would look at Tom <coughs> Log and I would look for that. So add that to your log. So, um, like right now, I, I really don't know where to look for it. So, uh, so yeah, next, like whenever, whatever we do, just just add, keep adding stuff to your log, so that we can find it. Um, it would be under, you think under Cura somewhere. Um, let me see. Let's just find it in recent wiki changes. Um, it wasn't our D3D Universal FAC, Tom? Was it under FAC? Yeah, yeah, that's it. All right. Okay, so it's D3D Universal FAQ. Okay. So, Control C, I'll add that to the January product for January 28th here. So, uh, yeah, so okay, actually. Somebody refresh me on where the pin plotter um, free CAD file is. Okay, so let me um, go to J. I found a couple, but neither of them, I don't think. Okay, yeah, I'm there. You're at J? Yep. Okay. Uh, let, me, let me get on J page. So, yeah, plotterpen.fcscd. It's on under Monday, January 27. Okay, so that's the one that's just, 
the CAD file does not have a like a, a clip to hold oh, the yes. to the bracket. Oh uh, yeah. So let me uh, let me uh, add what you. What did you guys use? Just like yeah, it's on a D3D Universal page. Or? Yeah, it's on a D3D Universal okay. page under Plotter. And I'll I'll put an explicit link. And that's okay. yeah, pen holder clamp that FCSTD. It's there under. <coughs> let me oh, let me add that link. I, see it. I did not. Um, yeah, that one. That one you can use. Did not make the connection between that image file and that being the pen holder clamp. So. Yeah. All right, I got it then. That's good. That's from the D3D Universal. Uh, hash and plotter or plotter. Okay. Yep. yep. Okay. So that should be pretty fun. Um, you'll see how it works, and you can write various letters. You can do. Uh, I didn't get a chance to document it, but I mean, if we could. Uh, what we have currently is using Inkscape to generate G code, and on it there's a couple of notes that we added so when you actually go to save as you select the three axis G code option I started getting into work, like documenting all those different settings yeah I have it I, I started that also at using Inkscape to generate G code under G code plot settings so I would like set Z working height to zero make sure you're within like the boundaries that the I put size my log to some you did images if oh, there, cool. I'm not sure okay, I so not. okay, so see Jessica log. Okay. Uh, which I added to the G Inkscape to G code page. All right. What is this? Images? No images. Uh, We've had a hard time uploading. They yeah. Go so, okay, so for example, like there where you have the red, red means the file's not up there, so just click on it and then yeah. just click yeah. choose yeah. file. Is that working? Yeah, it did last night. That's what I was trying to do in there. I was like holding the computer right. up. I'll try it again. Okay, sure. okay, so, yeah. so internet issues. Mm -hmm. It should be, internet should be okay. Maybe okay here. Okay. So do that. Um, let's see. In the words, we have steps. And the only other note on the log quick keeping. Question. Yeah, just one quick comment on oh, log go keeping. Okay. Newest on top, because once you have enough entries, it's going to be hellish. Like for example, if you go to my log. I would have to scroll through about 50 pages to get to the current, you know, like I've got a lot of pages on my log. I keep like backlog of up to like 2017, oh. but but to keep the newest on top so when you open the page, you're at, you don't have to scroll down. So that's just one, one comment on the log that you should do. And Jeremy, you're saying? I quickly watched through the video from yesterday. I didn't see how you guys attached the paper or whatever you're drawing uh, onto the uh, bed. Yeah, we just used the magnets. The tape or? No, we used the four magnets. Do you have spare magnets? Yep. Yeah. So do that. Now, we need to. What we also need to do is upload the G the file. Don, did you get a chance to upload the actual file? Let's see. Because we have a file that you should probably use as a test because it has... Uh, what happens there, because the plotter is as it is, when you start the print, or the, the plot, you get the, the probe running off the edge of the bed because it's too far up front. So what we did, we appended a little G-code command that says, move over on X and move over on Y so you're back on the bed prior to the homing operation. So we appended that to the file that we generated through Inkscape. Um, 
Okay. And to make it easy, let's see. Let's see what we have on Don's. Yeah, Don, if you can upload that yep, test file, test file that will be a best start so you can observe. Like, you can go into the text file and actually look at the G code commands in there. And what it basically does is you home the X and Y, but actually, yeah, you can home the X and Y, but after that, in order to home Z, you got to move it over a little bit so you're back on the bed. Now, I did start to write in here, <coughs> even after we were done yesterday, Yeah. Um, there are options in Inkscape to set, I think, what we were sort of manually changing. Okay, okay. So, if with a little more trial and error, you could probably export everything in a finalized state mm. out of Inkscape. Yeah. When we talk about the left and right versus upper and lower coordinates, we could have yeah. set that you know, uh, minus 40 okay. in one of those, I bet, and it would have just... Okay. Set that initially, but my file doesn't have that. So in okay. theory, my file should still work. We just had to edit it manually. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I think there's still the okay. ability to make all that work directly out of Inkscape. Yeah. It'd be good to see both. Actually. That's good. Yeah. So. I would like to see how you G code. Yeah. So. So yeah. I have some things to upload. That's yeah. Fine. Please I upload. So. So Jeremy, the the easiest thing is you you can uh, open the file. You do you do HTML stuff, so you you understand a little. You, what's your coding level? Yep. Um, I'm fairly proficient in PHP. And okay, so <laughs> so edit edit the file. Yeah. You'll look in there. Look, just look in the file and see where it says. Um, one thing you can look at. We do have an instructional on on like G code on the wiki. So let let, let me actually add that page so you can look at some G code commands so you get basically familiar with it so the g-code page on the wiki takes us to yeah yeah there's a page there um, I'm gonna just link that to today's notes um, Yeah, so we, we kind of peeked into G-code a little bit for explanation of G-code. But the main thing in G-code is, like, you do commands which are G0, which means move. And then you say X100, Y100. So basically you say G0 and then followed by the, the axis and a number. So that's kind of the core of G-code operations. And you have special codes which come from Marlin. And there's some M codes M codes, G codes in Marlin, um, but in Marlin, um, there's the homing command, which is what was it? It was G28 for home X Y, and then there's G28 for Z, which you have to do before, well after you move the bed over in our specific plotter case, and then you have the main thing, like the thing you need to include in the G code that's not going to come out of G code tools. In Inkscape is going to be the G29 command, which is level the bed. So the procedure for doing a good plot using our plotter using Marlin means that you do the bed leveling, and after that you go into just like on a 3D printer for the first layer, you go to baby stepping. Uh, so uh, so basically tune baby stepping and then you move the pen down until it's right at the surface and then it starts plotting so that way you actually get the automated bed leveling feature translated into the pen plotting so that once you get it to the right level it really doesn't matter how crooked your bed is it will stay on the paper so, and we've seen that yesterday it works awesome because uh, otherwise what would happen with us like um, you start plotting and then it might come off the page because it you know you got an unlevel something and here we're allowing the tolerance for a lot of inaccuracies like you can have up to I don't know how much but I mean half an inch or something of unlevel from one side of the, the bed to the other and you'll still get a perfect plot um, you because we're doing G29 within the G code to get the bed level uh, across the whole bed so I think that was pretty cool um, 
we do have the the workflow where we can now take any any image and then convert it into lines. The way it comes out in a, in a technique that we're using that Jessica developed was it's going to be lines, like slanted lines one after another until they fill the entire object that you're trying to print. Um, Jessica, how much of that do we capture on, the, yeah, on your be, log? It should be there. I have the names okay, wrong. Cool. Sort of messed yeah. up, but okay, yeah, so Jessica's got some screen captures on that process of how to take a, a scalable vector graphic, so that's a, that's a file. But the thing in, in Inkscape is you need to convert all these files, like the, the vector graphics files, into paths. So there's a, you go into, within Inkscape, in the file menu, there's a, let, let's look at that. If you open up Inkscape, there's a path menu and then you have to do something like object to path. Uh, we used object to path to generate the path. Do we also do trace bitmap or which we know? Yeah. Let me mess around with that, but then the it's different. It was different for the for the text. The, the, oh, the, the text okay. was just the top one, and then the joining it. This uh -huh. the vector yeah. images are slightly different. And okay. the main thing was that trace vector path to use the bottom set was as multiple and. Okay. And you have to delete the extra layers. There's like multiple layers on top of each other. So you actually slide one over and just keep one of them. Okay. We weren't doing it, we were getting this kind of crazy. Okay. okay. So under the path menu within Inkscape, there's object to path, which appears to work for letters, and tracing bitmap appears to work for when you have an image file. And there's tool chains where you can go from bitmap images like PNGs into vector files, so we use other software to do that. Uh, Inkscape has the capacity to convert bitmaps into vector files too, um, so you can play with different ways. But if you have a scalable vector graphic like the uh, one that's on an instructional there, try that as a start. You can find a bunch of them online. I, I was looking for it. Actually, a lot of them you have to buy like for this graphic stuff. I, I actually had a hard time finding any useful um, plotting files that weren't free. I guess this is kind of an area which is not like STL files where you find tons and tons of files on the internet for anything you want. Uh, of course there's some paid ones, but here it seemed like for the for the plotting and laser cutting files there's a lot of proprietary, well just just stuff you gotta buy. So uh, I guess setting up a library of um, useful art uh, that would be another part of li type of library you could set up on a wiki so that you can generate a lot of useful stuff and people can use it and have an easy way to do it. But just one comment on what's happening here. I mean, one of the purposes of the Steam Camp is that we make all this stuff like absolutely transparent because I, I mean, I'm seeing that for all the stuff that we're doing, it's like, man, you got to dig so hard everywhere. So we're trying to make that bam seamless you can do plotting you can do lasers you can do 3d printing um, you can make battery packs motors like all these basic things that right now are just all over the place and there might be like one guy that has something that's actually yeah that's really cool but then okay one it's just that so you still need uh, this whole integrated set or it's like in a completely different tool chain that's either proprietary or just using simply other software that we're not using and there are certain choices we make like for example why do we use Marlin why we why are we doing this plotter through Marlin when well, Marlin is the most used most common 3d printer firmware in the world like there's most the entire I mean literally like the, the entire 3d printing world uses Marlin so okay let's be collaborative Let, there's a huge community there there's Marlin developers and it's a well-supported thing, so let's use it and now adapt it as opposed to now, and we have options to do a hundred others. But how do we cho make those choices? And that is by the robustness, the collaborative user pool, and basically access, and then extensibility. If it's open source, naturally it's fully extensible to all kinds of other operations. So, so maybe we can create a plotter cura or whatever, an addition in Cura where we're including the the plotter tool chain or then the laser cutting tool chain when we add the laser cutter. So 
we have to go to all these softwares to make it happen just make uh, make do with less but still getting very high high functionality with a focus on the integrated tool set as opposed to like individual uh, specific uh, workflows uh, and I'm going to call out to Ray so Ray is a developer he's doing uh, the next OSC Linux version but Ray you mentioned so if you hear this um, I'll pass this I'll make sure you hear this uh, we can if you're so we're, we're actually looking at Cura and Cura may may be in trouble because Lulzbot sold out to another company and that's Lulzbot Cura that we use and it may be an endangered species so uh, we don't know whether the new company will maintain or even continue with Cura hopefully they will but if not we have to be ready since it's fully open source we can take it where it is right now and modify it so but actually a modification nonetheless to, to perhaps add the plotter workflows or just simplify them or just make um, make custom G codes like just little additions like the scripted beginning and end G codes that make it really easy for us to convert from one function to another and I do like the innovation already from Don where it's like okay just put the pen right on the 3d printer head which actually works really well because it's right next to the height probe uh, so we can use the same height probe without having to, to change anything because right now if you change the tool heads you, you simply have to unbundle it's actually pretty easy just just take out the height probe out of the wire loom and make it accessible so you just put it on a, on a plotter attachment if you use the separate plotter attachment uh, but, you, but with the addition that Don did now we can use the same tool head uh, nothing no changes outside of putting in different g-code uh, generating g-code using a different way and we also talked about another way to generate g-code like Cura since we like you know SDL files we're quite familiar with so let's maybe write on those so say we do uh, SDL files that we generated in FreeCAD another way to get to the plotting like say you want to do letters like outlines of figures you can easily take Cura do a 3D object that you just do a layer like say in the FreeCAD has has uh, letters and other things but say you draw something that you want to plot out you can do vase mode as the slicing setting in Cura and then the printer will be ready to do a trace the contour of that of that shape uh, so you can use Cura to generate that g-code for the plotter uh, that would be a cool thing so so you're taking SDL files you're actually generating the g-code within Cura as a alternative way to generate the g-code for plotting the plotting workflow and there's many many tools you can use for plotting like okay so Inkscape is one there's of course uh, there's flat cam which generates like circuit milling this is more like for circuit milling things um, but for example if we're using flat cam or KiCad so KiCad does circuits it'll get you the kind of traces patterns that you need for circuits well that would be relevant for the plotter uh, not a cutter but a plotter if we're doing the blocking like the, the workflow where we draw the circuit pattern on the circuit board with the pen using a marker a sharpie that blocks the copper so you can etch it so that would be another way to use um, useful way to use the plotter for circuits so so basically the circuit can be circuit uh, well the plotter can be called a circuit plotter or a drawing plotter uh, you can use that for the two applications um, which is good so it applies directly to the workflows of making simple electronic circuits so today what we'll try to do is we'll get busy right away on the the Arduino which is the copper uh, it's called strip board it's a board that's got holes with copper on it we put all the components into it and that way you just have to make wire connections simple soldering connections on the back so we're going to make a fully functional Arduino Uno with actually the right header spacing so that you can plug in existing hats or existing shields for the Arduino uh, which are attachments that you can make that Arduino is compatible with. So there's like hundreds of different shields like for example say you want to control like uh, solenoids or relays 
can put this shield on Arduino. It has all those connections there. So, so Arduino is a nice modular kind of a device where once you have it, you can add and stack functionality like one on top of another, actually. So for the welder that we're going to prototype tomorrow, I mean, you can have, say, a shield right on top of the Arduino, and then say you need more real estate, you know, you can put another one and another. So you can really have this nice modular sandwich with the Arduino on the bottom. And there's no reason why you can't, for example, add, you know, your power elements and your fan. Uh, on our 3D printed power electronics module, which which you'll see tomorrow, hopefully we, we get to that. Um, you can keep stacking that Arduino with, with components on top so you can have these modular uh, construction sets for electronics. Very useful. And then being, being able to do the Arduino from scratch is really powerful because how much does this little uh, chip cost? It's like a dollar to get the actual microprocessor chip, the dual inline package, 28 pin, but you know the, the the black chip that the Arduino is built on. Um, those things are like under a dollar. It's like I don't know. It's like isn't it like ten cents if you buy ten thousand of them or something. It goes down way in price. Um, but it's very inexpensive. So say you have you know Armageddon came. Uh, Tom's in his bunker. We're still still gonna make our <laughs> make our <laughs> electronic circuits and 3D print and survive really well. So <laughs> comparatively, <laughs> yeah. Uh, because we'll, you know, we'll have the, the Arduino uh, robots uh, still planting our greenhouses in the fallout, and we'll have renewable energy still, uh, stuff like that, so we can survive Armageddon. But no, this is more for peacetime uses. This is about lifting up everybody in the Armageddon that exists today, because 50% of the world's population is still uh, kind of hurting, so let's help everybody do this. And that's that's why we're doing this. So My give people a generalized skill set. Okay, and Don says his file is up. So um, Both the, uh, Don log. The modified part and uh -huh. the test plotter. Okay. I so that we, need, we need to add the G code extension to the upload. Okay. Extension. Very cool. So this is the G code. So now we have on. Um, let me actually. Um, yeah, I'm capturing this. I'm capturing this so we can review this. But yeah, we have the G code plot screenshot of all the settings that you need to do. Like for example here, coordinate system is 70 by 70 millimeters. That's just the size of the image that we generated in Inkscape. So you, can, you have this sample. This is your good plotter file, the D3D utex plot.gcode.zip. So a zip file on the wiki. But I think... Um, so I think we have 70 in these two places, uh -huh. but one of them may need to actually go oh, yeah. here. So Left I think we need to review. This is, ah. this is a little more where you can refine it and have it yeah. come directly out. Okay. The there's so there's for example like right x coordinate, upper y coordinate. Those have to match. Like I I've done this, and if that doesn't match your Inkscape file, you're not going to have a successful export, so make sure that's correct, the XY coordinates there. And then we're talking about left, there's both right and upper, and then there's left and lower. Oh, I see. So maybe if we do left and lower, no, that's probably like where we're, I don't know, we have to play with those other settings, left left X and lower Y, if that changes. But, but right now, the, the correct G-code file is there and and just to go through it just a little bit so we download that unzip it and uh, so let's take a look at this G code file just to take a look at what we were talking about before regarding the G code that's okay so open with the text document so open with G edit and uh, look at the first few lines uh, it's got like G00 so actually Marlin does understand G00 but I don't think we need okay the, the things that we absolutely need there's some other stuff like G21 I think you probably do need that G21 sets the scale to millimeters that's good possibly need that uh, G91 G0 G91 sets absolute coordinates then we're going to G0, Z0, like 
we're setting the height at zero for the Z. Okay, the important stuff is it's like line seven or so. G G28 X0 Y0, which homes the XY. Then we're doing G0 X negative 40 and G0 Y negative 40 to move over so we're back over the bed in our particular configuration. And then we go to G28 Z0, so at that point we zero the Z axis, which means the probe hits uh, the senses the bed, which means that, of course, the probe has to be above the pen, but not so high that the pen would actually hit the, the platform. Uh, so so the, basically the probe has to be like four, you know, put it like four millimeters above the pen tip. So then you go to G29, you do, that's the magical bed leveling, which keeps the pen on a bed the whole time. And then we're going back to setting absolute coordinates, G90, and then it actually starts. Um, and one note about the G code here, it always has a feed rate, so F2400, that's the feed rate. Uh, so basically we're passing a speed every time we do a, do a command here. So what that means, we tried it, like we were trying to say, okay, now we've got the settings on the LCD of the, of the, the printer. We're trying to put it down to higher speed, but it actually didn't work because it, it feeds a particular feed rate already in front of every command. So uh, turning up the knob on the screen does not increase the speed. Typically that would, would increase your speed. And we can probably parse these files to get out all the feeds so that we can control the speed. So you can do it like really fast on I a plotter. That in my log. Okay, excellent. And Don mentions that in a log. So that's good. Um, I'm just asking images up for this process, and like the G code for that other Hey, sticker. Chris. And I'm just wondering, like, so would I add that to this, or it's going to vary depending on uh, and this, the printer setup? You'd have to adjust that depending on the printer setup, or is it going to be the same addition to this G code? Because I can put it in right now and then put this on there. Work yeah, the, the thing we need is, um, in the G code itself, the lines that we need is everything up to up to G90 there, set okay, absolute coordinates. So, so everything up, this. just add to the okay. initial file. So Chris, we actually, um, going over the plotter workflow, which we did yesterday, you can look at the Facebook, stuff like that. Um, so I'll rec I'm, I'm recording this so I can upload this when we're done here. Um, let me actually plug in before I run out of power. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, Chris, after we, we go through this, you can review this whole thing about the plotter workflow. But, Chris, where are you at on... Um, terms of where you're at. Um, we're going to do some uh, uh, free cat work, but I want to um, a little bit uh, well, after 11 with, with Jeremy, if you're still, um, that still works for you. Um, but uh, yeah, it works. Okay, cool. What we're running into right now, I'm still um, trying to figure out uh, what I'm missing on the uh, power. Uh, uh, we have now both D3Ds to the same state. Um, all um, mechanically sound and then wired up, uh, with the exception of, um, yeah, whatever we're missing with, with the power. It seems like uh, in both cases there's just not, uh, it's not enough uh, current for the stepper motors. Uh, um, in both cases the Y axis isn't working, uh, but the X axis is, but only in one direction. I mean, so yeah, I'm not, uh, okay. I was hoping I could um, yeah, get, some, get some help here too. Okay. Did you see all the YouTube videos on electronics connections? Yes, that's what that's what we went that's what we went through. Um, okay. Okay. Can't hear your voice well, but you gotta speak up. Okay. Now, now I can bus. It looks like you guys had uh, uh, on all the videos and what we started with with just wiring up the 5 uh, I was trying experimenting. I was trying to put uh, if, if we got power to both uh, uh, 
by the end of May 11th, if it was going to have enough power. Um, anyway, so uh, that, uh, that's where we are you don't right now, both of these kind of... Okay, so you don't need the, the bottom plugs. There's nothing in the... We don't have a bed, so you don't need D8. Yeah. So get rid of that. I don't know where that's going. Which is... D8 is the bottom of the blue. Uh, the bottom of the blue you don't need, oh, yeah. right? That's... Is that a fan? What is that? If that's yeah. the fan, you need it to go to D9. Not the fan, the blower. The, the permanently on fan goes into the 24 volt, the bottom of the green. Yeah. So the power from the power supply goes into the bottom of the green. Okay. Yeah. Now, did you? You've got the controllers that you've got. Uh, are they? Did you change them for 24 volts? The diode, the diode snip. Yes. Okay. Yes. So what's the behavior now? So, let's see. So you got the permanent fan, the fan permanently on. Yes. Okay. Yeah. 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 Looks good to me. So what happens when? You yeah. So what happens? So. We can't, we cannot hear you very well, I don't believe. Uh, okay. Now we oh, we're, sorry, we're just testing uh, one driver at a time, um, uh, uh, and one driver at a time uh, here. Um, so now when we come in to actually move the motor. Yep. You need the end stops. End stops need to be plugged in. If you don't have end stops plugged in, you're not going to work. Do you have end stops? Depress the one switch. Depress the end stop for that axis while you're trying to cause the motor to rotate and see if that gets it to go both directions. End stops are the uh, the two. So um, you can check if they work. Like so, end stop should be in the first and fourth location for the X and Y. I really like the can't hear you. Uh, so I, I guess I didn't realize that the end stops need to be plugged in in order for it just to move and add motors. Um, yeah. Uh, what? Okay, all. so the, the easy procedure is plug in both X and Y and hit home in the menu under prepare. Prepare home. Home axes. And if the end stops are plugged in, yeah. then they should spin and the proper proper motion is that you have them spin both spin like one one will spin until either like you trigger the end stop or until it kind of goes far yeah. enough and then it switches to the next one to the y but yeah you can do one at a time but what i do is to, to test it is proper behavior like i would plug in x y and z um okay. plug all of them and then hit hit prepare and home axes and then you'll see the first one go then you see the second one go, and then you see the third one go. Uh, if you press, if you trigger then stops, then it will shift to the next one immediately. So you see that kind of logic? Yeah. So you can quickly get... Yeah, that's what we had yesterday, um, and uh, it must be around the end stop around because they would put me in the one direction and I would manually figure them, but... Yeah, I think it's end stops issue. Check, check your end stops, man. Uh huh. Yeah. 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 That's that's gonna. Okay. So crossed wires and end stops. And also wires plugged in. Make sure they're plugged in. <laughs> yeah. Um, the okay. issues on. We're gonna jump up and, and try this up, um, and then try and join you guys back in a, in a, in a couple minutes. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Turn off your video, please, so we save bandwidth here, since yeah. we're we're uh, yes, yes. we're bandwidth poor. All right. Excellent.
Is he sending video? No, he was. Okay. I mean, but just no, for, no, but I mean, for a second he was. Because okay. we had to look at his... Yeah. <coughs> his thing. But I, I, when I just thought it was this one here that was sending video to one. No, no. We're not doing that. Okay. On the... Yeah, so Chris is running into some standard issues. This is like pretty tricky, but there's a very explicit and like bam solution thing to this. You got to make sure your end stops are working. So you can, if you doubt whether they're working, put a voltmeter across the leads. They should be closed. When you trigger the end stop, it should open. That's how they work. So check your end stops are working. So when you, but in order to test the motors, you have the menu and you do the prepare and then home axes. That's the quickest way to check whether all your three mo motors are working. So you click home axes, pending motors being plugged in, pending end stops being plugged in, they're going to work, period. If that doesn't work, then you go to troubleshooting. So one, did you plug in the wires? Is the wire broken? Is the end stop in plugged in properly? Is the end stop broken? Is the end stop plugged into position one and four, which is X min and Y max? And is the Z probe, I think the Z probe has also to be plugged in. No, I don't know if the Z probe is, but I know that the two X and Y have to be plugged in. Uh, and it's going to work. And then you have to troubleshoot. Like we rarely ever get a get a motor that's bad. Cables, yes, easily easy easily bad. They might be cross wired. And then you might because the plugs are so tiny on our on the ramps, you think you plugged it in, but you plugged it in on three three prongs or something. So those are the things to check. Or you plugged it in and it's like in, but it's not all the way in and it's not making a connection. But there is no magic. Like this is like once again no magic you go through a checklist and then um, it has to work and then the deeper problems are like say you actually your ramps board is broken like yes for example when you knocked off that capacitor right. you're not going to get motion there so you have to at that point you got to get in use the other Y because we have a spare mm -hmm. but if it's actually bad and you ran out of spares then you need a new ramp board, but only like five bucks, so it's you not that bad. On, you solder it onto that little spot. Is it soldered right there? The, the little capacitor? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like... Yeah, it's a tiny little... Tiny like little leads, like... Tiny. It's going to be hard, so mm -hmm. like that might be the end of its life, maybe. But no, I mean, you can you can connect to it, but you might have to do like like a solder, a little wire. If those leads broke off, then you just get one of those little capacitors for one cent and you know, mm -hmm. attach it with wires or something like that, or attach it on the back side of that board or somehow, well, mm -hmm. back side you can't really do it. So you have to get into hacking. But those boards are pretty readily accessible, so if you burn one out, you, you know, once you get going, you probably have spares and stuff like that lying around. Uh, but yeah, the, the more difficult things are, like the actual board is bad, or the drivers are bad, but that doesn't happen too much. It's typically like you can plug in the wires or the end stops are not good, something like that. But Chris should be getting up and running in a second because that's, I think, the problem is easy to diagnose there. Uh, so that's where they are. They're still doing that, so I don't think they're going to give us love on the, on the CNC plotter. Not the CNC plotter, but the CNC drill. So, okay, but let's focus on today. So let's go straight to the Arduino work. So ideally, I will definitely get the strip board Arduino from scratch, which is a great accomplishment. If that thing works, it's like, wow, I've never, actually never done it myself. I've used them a lot. Uh, there's a very basic strip down design that we have. We can definitely do that. Um, ideally, we would have enough time that we print ourselves a holder for the little motor that we have. And Tom, do we have 12 volt batteries lying around so we can run the motor? Yes. 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 Or we can take a drill, like your some of your drill batteries, they're 18 volts. The motors we have are 24 volt, so we'll go anywhere up to 24 volts. So we can either use like regular battery or like the drill 
batteries and power up our motor, but ideally we, in the advanced version of today we would do keycab to flat cam or even just like drawn by hand and then export G-code like in Inkscape. Okay, so we know Inkscape tool chains. So we don't have to figure, well, we can draw things in Inkscape. We can get set the correct scale and make little circles or, or make a dot like every 0.1 inch and like literally draw the pattern of the chip that we're going to put into the a raw circuit board. Um, and then we can drill that out mm. and then we can put the chip in and then make the Arduino from there. So that would be super cool if we could do that. Um, but let's see where we get to on the first there was part. There's a thing in the, at Gosh in Shenzhen that they did with, um, for you know, attaching, they had a plate where there was a, a cut uh, thing with open spots and you just put it on and wiped on the yeah. solder and then used a plate. It was like, so, it was so fast. I mean, you made this whole thing by just wiping it on, setting and like the solder. <laughs> it was all sort of one, the same idea, like you, you know, use but the plotter what? to make yeah. this, uh, interface for yeah. setting up this interesting work. But then you had to put like all the components on or what? Yeah, you still had to put the components on. Yeah, separately. yeah. But it was just in terms of the soldering, it was so Yeah, quick, you put it in crazy. an oven and it just... Yeah, they used a hot a plate, paste. which then there's an issue yeah. with the hot plates or whatever. Yeah, so, fine. yeah, so there's a good way, I mean, surface mount, you, you take it a was, copper board, you can etch it and then just put the components and then smear the solder on. That's, And yeah. then you just put it in an oven and yeah. there you go. That's it. Yeah. So that's, it's doable. Mm -hmm. Um, all doable. So for today, let's download, let me just do like one download, like there's a nice video that shows how this simple DIY Arduino can work. Uh, it's on a DIY Arduino page. So let me do like one download so none of us, not all of us have down, to download and I'll put it on a card and then we can watch that and go through that and just slowly in repeat mode just, okay, this is the pin and it goes to that pin. Uh, so basically we have a bread, the copper clap board and it's, it's called strip board. It's got holes in it already. So it's got the correct 0.1 inch spacing already. We just put in our components and then we got it. So we, we snap in the components, we solder them in, and then we have to know which to connect to which. So we actually do have a, a fritzing file. I, I'll pass it on to you here. Fritzing, do you guys know what fritzing is? Yeah. Fritzing. It's like the lowbrow low version of KiCad. Oh, it's um, -I -G? Fritzing. -I -G? Uh, if you have OSE Linux, open up Fritzing. Fritzing. Oh, I should try actually. I'm gonna have the keyboard problem with this. It's just the internet. Okay. Uh, so that should come stock on OSE Linux. There you go. Fritzing. And I'll get you the. I'll give you the file. So let me. Uh, so right now. Let me just download that fritzing file uh, that was on from Michelle. Uh, let me f just put on a USB and a stick here and give it to you guys. Uh, but we have a file that corresponds to what in the video that we're going to watch to see how all the things are wired together. This is the corresponding fritzing file that's designed on a breadboard. So just to show you how it looks. Uh, it's a .fzz file. This is from Michelle, who's uh, generated it. So where's my .fzz here? Well, let's let's open up here. So file, open, open recent files. Yeah, this is this thing here. So there it is. Um, that's the actual Arduino. Here we go. So let's zoom it in a little bit. But this is what an Arduino looks like. So this is a program called Fritzing. It's like a drag and drop program for simple electronics. It's like for artists and <laughs> us because we're in the Steam Camp. Mm -hmm. So what you need there is your microprocessor and essentially you can, like the simplest, simplest Arduino is essentially the the chip, but you gotta, what, what do you need here? Like you need a few things, right, to make this work. I mean, you need some power, right? Like people eat food, this thing eats electrons. We need to give it power. Uh, the power leads are actually there. Um, but there's there's some way to connect it to power. You have to 
you have to give it data. You have to let it give you, you data out. So we need like three things right there. Now, what else do we need here? We got these header connections, which are actually ready-made plug-in, like 0.1 spacing connectors. They're called DuPont connectors. All this stuff here is at 0.1 inch spacing, 2.54 millimeters. And these headers are actually physical headers. Uh, I can bring out, we'll, we'll get to the components like in real life and you can see the video. But just to go through this conceptually, headers, this is where the hats plug in. So this pattern, that exact spacing, like a couple of inches, like six, what, 60 millimeters or so, uh, that's, you can plug in standard Arduino hats to it. The spacing is correct. It happens that the standard strip board, and what is strip board? It's, it's strips, which are all connected, but they're, not con they're connected up and down here, but they're not connected left and right. So it's a very convenient way to make connections uh, where it's not just holes where you have to connect everything. It already has some connection. So for example, if you got this at, at mega chip, you can see that all those pins here, like one, two, three, four, five, six pins are connected directly to these headers through the strips. So as long as you solder this header onto the strip board, you automatically have made the connections to those pins. And those are like inputs or outputs, whatever they are. Um, then we have more headers here, and here you see that, okay, that header we actually broke off because uh, we don't use it. This one's broken off. Whatever you see, okay, let's see maybe a zoom in detail. Um, wherever there's a break, that's an actual break we have to respect. Like here, for example, that header is not connected directly, like straight up. It's actually wired over through little jumper wires. Uh, because of how we have to lay out things in order to fit them on this board. Okay? So, uh, the lines here are just wires. So, you're taking, for example, for the red, you're taking a wire, plugging it into this hole, this specific hole, the fifth hole over. You're carrying it over to here. And what is that connecting? That's connecting to this pin here. Um, because that's a straight path from that pin. This is strip board. So we're connecting to there, we're connecting to that, and we're connecting to that. So the red is the power wire, um, but that means we've got the power connecting to that specific pin right there. So you can trace this, this is some logic here. And the trick here, okay, we have to be meticulous, it's not too many components. We've got three capacitors, one crystal oscillator, and that thing determines the clock speed of this chip. It basically switches the power onto this. It, it's an oscillator that basically turns things on and off. I think 32 megahertz or 16 megahertz. But that's, you know, that's decent. Our computer here is like gigahertz. This is like 30 megahertz. So, you know, this tiny little chip has that much computing power. That's just plenty enough speed to run a Yeah. Motor. Yeah, like what are the speed limits if you, if you got like 16 megahertz that means like after you go through the Arduino code, like that slows it way down. It's not like assembly language. Um, how does the megahertz relate to the number of instructions you can get per second, like function, like things that you can do per second, like turn off this LED? Uh, how does it translate? Like, well, do, you, do you know that? No, not, not that. It, it, it all depends on the logic. How they yeah, it. yeah. But because we've got all this overhead on this 16 megahertz or 32 megahertz, let's say 32 megahertz, um, you can definitely do like kilohertz rates of but it, commands. It, it, at the end of the day, so that I means mean, milliseconds. Yeah, yeah, you have those kilohertz, and, and like, like yeah. I see, uh, I was clocking the, the thing at 31 kilohertz. Yeah. And that's something you can execute instructions that fast. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, 31 kilohertz instruction set. You can get a lot done. I mean, yeah. it's way faster than everything we're trying to drive. Right, right, exactly. And so if you're going down from 30 megahertz to 30 kilohertz, that means the overhead, like the number of just on-off cycles in the processing is like a thousand switchings happen for one instruction to get executed. That's, you know, sounds good to me. Uh, it makes sense. Um, 
now for so that means like we can't get rates higher than the clock speed like we can't get like 32 megahertz processing out of this because you have overhead on the software you can't get higher than that but if you're getting like only like a few hertz of, no that wouldn't make sense like I don't know just kind of intuitively speaking like a thousand factor of overhead yeah that's right and then if you go to machine code like I don't know how you program this like you can do C like typically you go through Arduino environment and you upload software that's in C based language uh, but how do you do actually communicate with this in like lower level language do you know how to do that uh, well I've done other computers that way not, not, not in yeah Arduino, but, but there's ways like you yeah, can yeah. So do you if you're a um, you know can connect to it and then pump in your code and say here run this yeah so uh, typically what we do t in order to upload software to this is we use Arduino and actually this header here that we have the six pin header with the power wires we're actually going to plug in another component this is actually not complete we're going to plug in a serial to USB converter so the communication lines are actually coming out of this six pin header uh, two of those pins are going to be power wires and the rest is communications. I think there's two more pins because a USB, how many pins does it have? Four. So, so we need to plug in that. Li we have a little component which has got six pins uh, on one side, and on the other side it has a USB port. So we can connect this directly to a USB port to the Arduino environment and upload code to this. So this thing, as we build it is a fully functional Arduino. You don't have to like hack it by soldering wires to it. You plug in to your computer, you use Arduino environment, which you upload code through. So that's really cool. Yeah, fully functional. Yeah, yeah. And, and when you buy the Arduino off the shelf, it's got this, it might have a few more LED lights, it maybe have has like more header pins. Yeah, it's like 50 bucks or something, right? No, it's not too bad. You can, like, 10 bucks for one of these. Like, if you go to China, it's no, like 5 yeah, bucks. For the Arduino, actually? Yeah. Yeah, yeah they're, they're pretty cheap. For the low low brow, this uh, Arduino Unos, maybe like the Arduino Mega, maybe a little more expensive, but not really. They're, I mean, this is, like, all so cheap because in mass production, this is, like, see the clay out there? It's got some sand in it. That's what it is. It's mm -hmm. reformulated sand. It's pretty cheap, like, if you get the mass production so, of it. Mm -hmm. It's uh, there like in electronics. Yeah, we could do a lot because there's a lot of silicon and germanium, trace germanium stuff and all of that. So uh, we're gonna have a com communication ability directly to Arduino environment um, through through little sketches that we'll learn about, <clears throat> and that we should do today because or tomorrow we'll do power electronics sketches. Today we we should do some like blink the, sta <coughs> the standard blink the LED thing. Um, but for now, here's what we got to kind of understand to trace. What are the other components? There's a couple of capacitors, and I don't, like, some of them have to do with, it's explained in the video. I'm, it's, I don't think we need to completely get into that. Uh, there's, like, one, let's see, is there a resistor or two here? There should be, like, a resistor somewhere. Um, we have to do, we have to look at, where's the resistors? I think there's a resistor, like, back there. Uh, socket, capacitor, wire. Uh, I think there's like a resistor too, but we'll, we'll look in the video. Um, but it's basically plug in the components into the strip board, make sure they're in the right location. <laughs> so the trick here is can we look at this and actually plug it into the right places? But it's not too bad because you've got, you know, like this is at the limit at the corner, so you have to be able to count to like 20 in order to be able to build this board. So if you enumerate it up to like 25 or so, you can uh, build this. Well, I've only got 10 fingers. Yeah. Well, you can <laughs> plug. <laughs> Many are so Jesus. <laughs> yeah. Well. One of the things, one of the things I've probably had with, like, say you're trying to build some sensor and you have the wrong slightly different even just the little any of these little components that yeah. all have really yeah. specific like this is the positive this is the yeah. negative and you have to go way into the <laughs> like that you know simple things like that it's the same type of resistor but each prong has a slightly different setting so you yeah. make sure you're checking at that level of you know, specificity that was a mistake i was making but yeah it's just 
like stuck on that for a long time, not knowing <laughs> how specific the components of the little well, but, but pieces are. But there is a are. clear metaphor like you know, you eat with your mouth and stuff yeah. like that. There's, there's <laughs> that kind of analogy. <laughs> that has to be very explicit because we're talking about like humans. We're like yeah. built of that at a much more complex level. We're like this yeah. way more complicated thing. But at the basic level, like things go in one way, come out the other, and things like mm -hmm. that. There is flows, and this you have to be very explicit because you're controlling the flow of electrons mm -hmm. here, and you have to tell them exactly where to go. Yeah. And these pins have a very specific functions uh, but basically all those pins all they are doing is I guess turning things like on or off right that's right. that's all these pins do they turn on and off well except for power and then you have analog you know, yeah inputs and outputs too so, right so those, those are going to be fluctuating yeah but that's the basic anatomy that you've got this microprocessor that has like inside of it it's got complex circuitry and actually, I don't think there's any open source versions, of, like that chip there is proprietary. Like, I don't think you can get the diagram off the internet for it. At present, I the don't. actual chipset. Mm -hmm. The actual chipset? Yeah. yeah, yeah. But Luke, who's <coughs> in on uh, Luke Layton, he's, uh, he's the guy behind the EOMA 68 laptop open source laptop, he's actually developing microprocessors for up to like cell phone level. This is m this is way below a cell phone, but he's doing that fully open source, keycad, like I, and then crazy. Is he doing this for a commercial company? Or? It's his project. Huh. He's, he's a startup. Uh, Google EOMA 68, we should add a link to that. It's on crowd supply. How you spell that? E O M A sixty eight. This is one of our guys. He's going to teach in the next camp, so we'll be making microprocessors pretty soon. Um, this first guy. Yeah, crowd supply. Look at that thing. So he's designing. This guy is very sharp. Luke, you're pretty good because he understands <laughs> modularity very explicitly. He designed this system to be extremely modular, completely OSC spec, and how we think about modularity. So it's a computer that basically lives on a card and you can put it into, uh, like the computer itself is on a card. So it's extremely modular. Mm -hmm. um, and the good thing is, there's a, a, so talking about electronics, where we are in the state of art, here we're building an Arduino, but the state of art is, there is a project called Open Silicon. And there, people are actually designing open source microchips and we're gonna probably end up helping them by getting the hardware infrastructure to do the clean rooms we can already do CEB walls if you if you plaster them and make them clean room quality you can make cheap buildings then you need vacuum pumps precision uh, motion things you need light sources and lens um, but um, Right now, those kinds of processes are very expensive because all the equipment is proprietary. Uh, but we can do, it would cost, like, to get to, like, 80s level technology right now, it would probably cost us, like, a million bucks or something. Uh, right now, a, a fab for the modern microprocessor costs about 10 billion, or a billion and up. Um, with standard open source cost reduction, you can definitely, like, I would say the factor of 100 modularity, open source, lifetime design, probably get you around a factor of 100. So we're talking about 10 million for open source fab for Apple chips. Modularity, open source, Modularity, open source, lifetime design. Lifetime. And yeah, you design it to keep, being to keep living. Not, not you throw it out because it's because one screw got loose. So you have to buy a new one, right? Yeah. So that's a, that's a big deal. Like, hundred factor I think like absolutely tenfold factor like you can look at it like John Deere tractor OSE tractor now we're not there at the level of final productization but already we've seen like I've seen in live track so my live track from 2014 power cube goes out I switched it out last year it lives forever the steel is not going to go anywhere 
hydraulics are going to live probably like 50 or 100 years. So you're talking about the difference between 10 year lifetime for a standard piece of equipment from John Deere to 50 or 100. Very clear case for 10x on lifetime. It's interesting. And then I wonder how it's going to push back because even you know 50 years ago a washing machine, our, 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 both our washing machine and dryer are like ancient, but you can manually fix it. Yes. Um, so I mean, yeah, they, they stopped. Yeah, was, yeah, you know, and, and they stopped making things like that. So I wonder if this movement also will push back on industry to just have to produce better products, or at least of take course. back their own products. We are going to be so the industry, and people who do not do this will, be will probably be stop on an exit way. Yeah. Yeah, from, from because read, uh, they, efficiency is good. That, that, that's affecting the auto industry because there's the, the big push for going with electric cars. Yeah, people want it, but the thing is, big. Uh, auto, the big three in Detroit, they don't they don't want it because then it would you could make cars would be very simple. You could have mean people could put together and maintain their own oil very easily. Definitely doesn't want it. <laughs> right. yeah. All the services. But, but so what was the other website you said about silica? Same Open thing. silicon. Open silica. S I L. So you said something about Detroit. Well, uh, so Luke is also silica. working on the open source ultra light Libre vehicle. Uh, the frame is here right on the wiki. This is what it looks like. You put any skin on it. This is Luke's work also. Hmm. So the answer to Detroit is, no, you just build it. Th these are the, what I was talking about, the, the Kevlar coated 3D printed tubes. So that's relevant for, Kev for vehicles. It's relevant for high pressure storage chambers for the hydrogen economy. Um, yeah. But yeah, this, I mean, looks, this this guy, uh, so Luke does this in like open PyScad. Uh, he doesn't like user interfaces. But um, yeah, this is crazy stuff. It's called the Embassy Elf. Uh, really for MBC, for Mythbuster concept, Mythbuster car. Ultra efficient Libre vehicle for everybody. Like the weird spelling, the Embassy Elf. But this is how you say it, this is how you spell it. <laughs> so anyway, uh, read about it. <laughs> this is going to change the world. Sure. Luke, we're going to change the world this summer. We're going to get a version one prototype. Great. So this is hydrogen. <laughs> is, that, is it going to be a... Uh, no, this right. is electric here. This is electric. Okay. This is, the first prototype is electric. Okay, but yeah, like super create, like <coughs> uh, minimal viable product. There's a hint there. L read it. <laughs> 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 read, read the specs. That's funny. <laughs> and this is not, this is a Mythbuster car, so anyway. Uh, Chris, how'd you do? I can't hear you. I can't hear you, Chris. Um, okay, there you go. No problem. Um, yep, that was the, that uh, makes sense now as a safety um, feature as well of the, um, other motors aren't going to move unless, unless there is a potential end stop at the other end of it. Uh, yeah. So you got to work out? That was definitely the problem. Yeah, yep. that worked out, and uh, first uh, auto-initialize um, uh, procedure. Uh, but uh, yeah, so right in the process, we um, uh, the broke the belt, popped out, broke the belt, so we're, we're running a new belt through. But uh, yeah, everything, uh, I think uh, that was our, our last major hurdle clear, so feeling good. We were able to get it to extrude still um, uh, yesterday, um, and so now we're going to put motion and extrusion together. Excellent. Excellent. But, yeah, so I want to uh, come and uh, check where, where you guys were, uh, uh, too, as far as um, uh, doing the remote recap. We're pretty good on that. Uh, we're going to focus on electronics today. All right. And I think anybody else wants okay. to. Cool. Yeah. No, we just went over the Arduino, and we're re we recorded the whole thing so you can actually listen to it. Uh, we should have that. Uh, so you can follow up. You can okay, follow right. up on the plotter. From yesterday, it's documented relatively well, and then <clears throat> you can follow this when you get to it. So sounds good, man. I'm glad you got that resolved. Yeah, awesome. Appreciate, appreciate the help. Um, yeah. Okay. So we're gonna uh, we'll follow up with the plotter. I got the plotter uh, attachment printed out too. Um, so we'll follow. Uh, yeah, we'll follow along with that. And, okay. Um, like I said, our, our goal is if we, when, when we get um, some uh, free cat up onto the wiki, we'll be our, uh, the uh, spin them out for the, for the mouth. So hopefully that will. Yeah, if you guys. Our, our okay. 
if you guys could get on a spindle mount for the 555 motor, that would help us because ideally today, if we have that, if you guys provide that to us, we can actually do the, do the CNC hole drill here for the second Arduino Uno, which is made from a plain copper board. So if you guys have it, that will help us. Cool. Cool. So that would just um, uh, a clamp and a place for the Z mount, right? Um, yeah, yeah, just a motor mount, like a, essentially like a, you're grabbing the motor and you're mounting on a Z, on a Z axis, on the X, X carriage. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, cool. Yeah. Awesome. Yep. yep. Okay, so let's, if you, if you guys want, we can check in like one, three, four, if you guys want. Yeah, that sounds good. One, three, four. Yeah, yeah okay. let's do that. Okay, let's do it, people. Great job. Okay. Awesome. All right. Awesome. We'll see you guys soon. Okay. Check out my Bye-bye. Okay. Um, so we're pretty good on uh, this. So let's, um, let me download, so just to show you the, the download page here on the wiki this is going to be the DIY Arduino page but let me just since it's a video like let's just download it once and I'll give it to you guys right so DIY Arduino page there's a nice video that shows the basic there's a bunch of DIY Arduinos but this one is this is what we're doing essentially mm. so that's the USB connection so we can plug right into a USB port like in fact you can plug that, I think that plugs in right in the computer, like the way it is right there. Yeah, like, it looks like mail. Um, yeah. Well, we have that, so let's go to YouTube. And then let's download it. So save from.net. Um, what do you guys use, like save from.net or to download? I just use a video downloader. What do you use? Video downloader. <laughs> oh, you call it it's a Firefox plugin. Okay. Know if it works in Chrome. So you type in the link. Okay. So let's get the low res like WebM or MP4, MP4 I guess. Oh. Let me do it. Um, okay, and then... Good morning stop. all. Stop. Now here I have... Stop this, like, download, save video ads. <coughs> video, so DIY Arduino. Arduini on desktop. Okay, so that should download in a second. Okay, so that's the video. I think I'll stop recording here since this video is a little long and we'll get to an update later as we as we build some of this Arduino. Stop recording, so thanks for watching.